It is my pleasure to be here with you. I would take you all home, too. Um, and you're right, Kitty, what I'm going to talk about is how we all have, already have what it takes. Um, I began this research journey, my whole career has been, um, I think of it as being a research adventurer, following questions and finding answers, such as we know kids grow and develop, but what about adults? What about us as parents? And that led to the six stages of parenthood. Or how do kids really feel about the important issues that they face every day? ask the children. And then the question that I've had for the last um, more almost two decades, what can we do to keep the fire burning in children's eyes? For too many children, that fire goes out. They're born learning. Um, at the time when I was beginning uh, the journey that led to Mind in the Making, although I didn't intend to write a book, um, I, um, uh, my next door neighbor adopted two twins from, from China. They had been in very difficult situation. One of them was critically ill, almost died, um, before they came to the United States and were adopted by my neighbors. But we, um, but you couldn't stop those little girls from learning. They wanted to see, to taste, to touch everything. And at the same time, I was doing studies of older kids um, in um, middle schools and high schools and founding that too many of them were really just completely turned off by learning, thought that, that they needed to learn in order to get a job um, and support themselves and not be bums on the street. But they had lost the other part of learning. That's important to get a job and not be a bum on the street. But they had lost that other part, which is the passion for learning that the little girls uh, next door to me had. So I set out to find out what can we do to keep that fire burning. And there are four major lessons uh, that I'd like to share with you. The first is, and you know this, um, that the architecture of the brain is built from the bottom up. Um, and it's not just, we used to talk about nature and nurture, it's not either or, it's both and. Um, but it's never too late. I'm doing a book now on the teen years and um, the growth and change, it's really cool, totally cool. <laughs> um, it's gonna be, it's going to be the antithesis of just wait until their teens is a threat. It's just wait until their teens as a as a as an exciting uh, stage in our in our lives as teachers and parents, um, because the brain development that they are going through is is unbelievable. Um, but let's go to the to the lab of Sam Wang. He's at Princeton University, and he's going to show us how important these experiences. Um, uh, in the brain are in the early years, that every one of them shapes uh, who they become. And what I love is that he speaks as a parent, says every once in a while his kid will be doing something like um, eating a banana or, or spitting out a banana or throwing a pizza or something, and he'll think just with wonder what's going on in her, in her brain. Um, the second important lesson is um, it's relationship stupid. Um, it's all about relationships. I just was reading a summary of the research on pre-K that the Brookings did. I don't know whether you've seen it, but it's worth going to their website and down, uh, downloading it. And it's the teacher who makes all of the difference. It's you. Um, it's us uh, as parents as well who make all of the differences. Uh, Jack Shonkoff says there is no development without relationships, and, and that's absolutely true. Um, the experiment that Ed Tronic did I particularly love because he just took what happens normally between that interchange between a young child and adult, and he stopped it and had the parent turn away and then come back, but hold a still face, not respond. And when you see that happen, the baby goes nuts, the baby reaches out, she flails, she does everything that she can to get the parent back engaged uh, with her, the little girl named Mackenzie at six months old. And when she finally can't do it, she just slumps over. So just those normal back and forth, those little clues and cues, you see how powerful it is at the moment when you stop it. The third important strategy um, is that promoting that back and forth that you see in, in um, in that normal interchange between adult and child is how children learn. And um, one of the really uh, great ways to illustrate it is to go to the lab of Patricia Kuhl at the University of Washington. She has a machine, um, you can see it in that picture um, that child has on a, 
like the hair, a hair dryer from Mars, um, this cap on her head that is non-invasive and non-intrusive, but can take a movie of what's going on in the child's brain. This is a child um, at 11 months, and um, you can see that what we used to think about learning is different when you can actually see uh, what happens in the child's brain. What Pat Cool's research shows is that, that even though babies aren't talking, they're learning about talking before they speak, and they're learning through that back and forth interaction where the child takes the lead. It's not the adult stuffing language into the child. It's that responsive back and forth and letting the child um, lead. It's not just um, uh, the adult leading, which I think is so critical. The fourth um, important finding is about executive functions. Executive functions are the top-down neurocognitive processes that involve setting and following through on goals. They bring together our social, our emotional, and our cognitive capacities so that we can pursue goals. And I think that's uh, what's so important uh, about them. So uh, I didn't start out to write a book at all. I started out to do a one-hour television show that would share what we knew about early learning. And along the way, I discovered that across academic disciplines, and they didn't always use the word executive function, but if people s promoted these skills, which do develop in children actually earlier than the preschool years, they begin to develop much earlier, that children were more likely to thrive now and in the future. They're very important to school readiness and school success, although um, I, I really like the idea of being at the, in the moment we were talking about that at our table and not having everything for the future. In fact, the teens that I'm working with says, let us be the age we are <laughs> and not everything for the future. Um, um, this is a paper that the Harvard Center on the Developing Child did, and they differentiate executive functions as the what of learning, um, that's, that, that's the content of learning, that's not, and the how of learning are executive functions. So think of content, literacy, numeracy, um, STEM sciences, all the other things, the content that children need to learn as what they learn, but executive functions promote how children learn. And studies have shown, a number of studies have shown that um, in, um, in studies where you, where you teach children executive function skills and there's, and there's a control group who doesn't have that kind of uh, information, children are much more likely to succeed in academic subjects now and in the future. It's not just in the future. We're not just talking about waiting 40 years. We're talking about now and in the future. Um, this is a study um, that I think is really important. It was a study that Megan McClellan did uh, with a group of colleagues. It was a study of adoptive children, and they were just using a whole battery of tests, and one of them asked parents about children's attention span persistence. Could they stick with something um, and not uh, totally flit around? And they found that when kids had this ability, it was measured by four questions at that moment, um, they were almost 50% more likely to graduate from college when they were 25. So you get the power. You get why I changed my whole life course and ended up writing a book and now developing all kinds of programs to share this information. Um, they're important to workforce readiness and workforce success, and Kitty talked about the work that we do with the workforce and workplace. Um, when you ask employers what they're looking for, it's not necessarily just technical knowledge. The most important, four most important things that they said in a survey of whom the kind of skills that they're hiring for, it's the ability to work in teams, to make decisions and solve problems, to organize and prioritize work, and to be able to verbally communicate. So these are really important, and this is a study also that I particularly love. It was done in Dunedin, uh, New Zealand, a place where I have been, and um, they did a whole battery of of measures uh, beginning um, at birth when children were very young. They found that executive function skills, particularly self-control, um, was predictive of children's health and wealth when they were 32, controlling for their IQ, so, um, and controlling for their socioeconomic status. So these skills are, again, important now and in the future, and they're more than self-control, and I'll get to that in a moment. But uh, one of the reasons that I, again, changed my life to focus on this was these are things that we can do that makes a difference, and research shows that they can be improved. So in the course of going out and interviewing more, hundreds now uh, researchers, I found seven skills that I call life skills. They're all 
call on those three components of executive function skills uh, that we've talked about, working memory, thinking flexibly, cognitive flexibility, and inhibitory control. Um, but they build on them and extend them. And you can see just from the list that they are more, um, that they're not just self-control. Um, um, being able to take on challenges or to make connections, which is creativity. So don't just think that executive functions are, um, are sitting still and being obedient. Now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through um, each of the skills. Uh, I always start with adults because I honestly believe that unless we have these skills, we can't promote them in children. So all of our training uh, focuses on our developing these skills to be able to live a life that we want to live, to have su the success that we want as we define it in our own lives, and then on kids. So I, uh, we always give uh, some sort of way of assessing your own executive function skills or some uh, sort of exercise. Um, this is one that we, um, a measure that we made up uh, based on a number of other studies. And um, the task that I'm going to give you is that you need to count the blue, they're bluish purplish. I can't tell what color they're going to show up, but you can see the color uh, there. They're no, they're no blue or purple, it's only one color. And it's going to start with a blank screen, and then a bunch of shapes are going to come uh, first slowly and then at you. And you have to count the number of times that a blue star appears. You ready? Ready, set, go. Okay, how many did you see? Okay, okay, I hear lots of numbers. Let's start with 18. I heard that. How many people heard 18? Let's go down. How many people saw 17? 16, 15, 14. Anybody under 14? Okay, let's go up. 19, 20, 21, 22. Okay, anybody over 22? Hard. I made it harder than I could do. This is not easy on purpose. Um, so, um, besides a bunch of shapes moving around, and I think some of you did, did you see anything else? I can't hear you. Did you see anything else? No. If anybody saw, oh, did someone say a cat? Okay. Anybody? How many people saw a cat? Okay, there are 400 of you, not many. Um, I'm going to give you the answer, but let's go back and look at this again. <laughs> now, you know why you couldn't see that? Yeah, I put you, I gave you a task, um, and I put you into a scarcity mindset. You didn't have enough time to do it. So you really had to use what's called selective attention. Um, and so there was no wonder that you didn't see the cat. That's, that's normal. Um, but selective attention is important when you're focusing. Um, there are times when you really do need to focus and just pay attention to that. But there are times, as you know, as a teacher, where you need to have eyes in the back of your head because someone is about to do something and you need to be able to pay attention to it. I was a teacher. Um, and um, if you put the kids into a, into a framework of selective attention um, or scarcity, they, they will not do as well on some tasks. Like if you gave them uh, a Raven's intelligence test and half of the kids were put into a mindset of scarcity, and the other half weren't. The kids who weren't would do better, and that's really important. Um, that can be like in one school in New York. This is a, um, a study that people who study behavioral economics have done. Uh, they found that the kids in the, the, the school was right near a subway, and the classes that were near the subway that was noisy, the kids didn't do as well on their tests. The kids in the back of the school where they were away from the subway did better. And it wasn't a matter of just the kids in this group happened to be better than the other kids. They could then put soundproofing in, and all the kids did better. So these other things affect our attention. It's limited, and it can get affected. 
and we can affect it. So that's really important to remember. It's a skill, but it's affected by the environment. Okay, um, I'm going to go on and show you how uh, focus and self-control begin um, for a personal and special reason. That is, um, Barry Brazelton, who's in this video, turned 99 two days ago, and I was at his birthday party. <laughs> So I just want to bring you Barry. Uh, he is uh, coming to the office three days a week at 99. Um, can't stop doing the work he loves. The question is, when does self-control begin? So uh, the point of uh, the neonatal assessment is that the origins of self-control are there from the very beginning and that there are things that we can do, like Isabella used Barry's voice to calm down, to help children begin to learn how to manage uh, and put themselves back together, as he puts it. And there are things that we can do. Uh, this is Megan McClellan. I told you about her before because she was the one who did the early study of adoption, uh, where they found that, uh, that uh, the ability to pay attention uh, was critical. Um, in whether or not kids graduated from college. She's gone on, she's at Oregon State, she's gone on to develop a series of assessments uh, to, uh, to measure children's focus and self-control or, or executive function skills, and uh, then games that you can use to promote those. Um, so for example, she has an assessment that's called the head to toe, knee to shoulder assessment. And the way that it works is, the adult says, touch your head, and the kids are just supposed to touch their heads, and then the adult says and does touch your toes, and the kids are supposed to touch their toes. And then she says, now we're going to get a little tricky. And she says, now if I say, touch your head, touch your toes. And if I say, touch your toes, and I show you touching your toes, you should touch your head. And then it goes knee to shoulder. It gets even trickier. This is used with four-year-olds, and this assessment is highly predictive of kids' literacy and math scores. Um, she has, it's Simon Says in another form. Um, you saw Simon Says in, in the game. Uh, she's developed a series of games for circle time, and most teachers have some sort of group time or circle time. That's about 15 minutes, um, and they're uh, coming out on an app soon. Um, and you can play these games, like they're like red light, green light, except for that it's yellow light, purple light, and sometimes it means stop, and sometimes it means go, and you switch it. You can see how those promote executive function skills. So you have to pay attention, take the knee to shoulder, uh, knee to toe, head to shoulder task. You have to pay attention, um, you have to remember the rules, working memory, you have to think flexibly because the rules keep changing, and you have to go on, uh, you have to use inhibitory control and, and not go on autopilot. So these promote executive function skills, all of her games do. And they're things that you can do uh, to promote her, um, uh, to mo the, promote these skills. Um, in intervention studies, she's found that they really do make a difference, that these can be promoted. Remember, executive function skills can be developed. Um, so now I'm going to take you to Walter Michelle. Um, the marshmallow uh, test, you see the marshmallows on my book. It was not my choice. It was my editor's choice, but it was, I fought him for a while on it, but I think ultimately it was a good choice because there's so much research. Uh, why single out this one? But it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's an important study. Now, um, as you know, the task is two marshmallows or a treat of the child's choosing because you saw some Oreo cookies in there too. Um, on one side of the plate and two and one on the other. So the child knows that, that can trust that those marshmallows will be there. It's not like you have to assume that the adult's going to give it to you. And uh, they have the choice of ringing the bell. They have to, they're four years old. They have to wait 15 minutes, which is a really long time. Uh, I know. I know. I know. And you probably all go home and give it to your kids. <laughs> but what Walter Michelle is not doing is giving this test to kids. Um, did you see the way the kids, name some of the ways that you saw the kids managing the wait. Yeah, turning away. What else? Walking around. What else? Holding their hand. Holding their hand, yeah. Anyway, um, uh, reframing that little girl who was going like that in the red shirt. She was um, probably thinking of the marshmallows, or Michelle has found anyway, 
that if you think of the marshmallows as fluffy clouds or balls of cotton, they're not so delicious. Um, um, th those sorts of techniques. And I just was at, um, uh, at uh, UCLA last week filming Jen Silvers, who actually worked with Walter Michelle and a number of the researchers who have followed him. And what they're doing now is studying the ways that children can learn the techniques that they can learn and do themselves to manage frustration. So the lesson of Walter Michelle's research is to help children develop the skills so that they themselves have those skills to manage uh, frustration. Perspective taking is thinking about how other people think and feel and how that's different from the way you think and feel. It's more than empathy. Um, and if, uh, if we were working together for more time than the hour keynote, uh, I would give you an exercise that asks you, why do you uh, not like to be, um, think about how you like to be treated and, and how come you sometimes treat other people in a way that you don't like to be treated? Um, we all do it, so why do you do it? Um, in fact, I'm just reading Option B by Sheryl Sandberg and Adam Grant and uh, the book about the loss of her husband that she wrote with um, a friend um, of mine and hers, Adam Grant, and, um, and she calls it the platinum rule because if you understand how other people think and feel, they might not want to be treated the way you want to be treated, right? Um, so uh, now I'm going to show you a little child development. This is Alison Gopnik at Berkeley. And uh, she studied what's called theory of mind or, under, or how children learn the skill of thinking, uh, understanding how other people think and feel. OK. Um, the, um, the upshot of this research is that this is a skill that we learn. And with adults, you can even it can be hard to figure out what someone else can think and feel. So I'm um, going to go next to the research of Larry Aber. Um, and he uh, has shown that in a curriculum where you embed thinking about how other people think and feel, that you can actually reduce conflict in the classrooms. So they use it as a part of literacy. So teaching those kinds of skills make a big difference. So. Um, that particular experiment actually built the skill of making connections because they had to short, sort objects, pictures by color and by shape, and then switch the rules. So you see it's using working memory, cognitive flexibility, and inhibitory control. Uh, it builds the skill of making connections. But the important lesson for teachers and for us uh, as parents uh, as well is that not just you're right, you're wrong, why did you make that mistake? Because learning involves making mistakes, and how can you learn from that mistake? Reflection is critical um, in the development of executive function. Critical thinking is the next skill. It's understanding what's valid and real. Um, there's a lot of attention these days, and again, if we were working together for longer, I would give you a task on alternative, uh, the fake news or alternative tasks, or when you believe something that turned out not to be true. And if you um, looked at this experiment by Judy LaRoche at the University of Virginia, what you would see is that even up to seven, children will believe she's got a machine that she says will turn like stuffed animals into real objects. And they will believe that up until about the age of seven because the adult, the important people in their life say it. Um, so it's very important to teach children how to differentiate fact from uh, fiction and one of the ways is, this is research by Laura Schultz at MIT, and one of the important ways is to not answer children's questions right away. Not tell them how things work. In this particular experiment, she gives them two boxes, first one, and if the adult shows the child how it works, the kids lose interest right away. But if they have to figure it out, they don't. So don't always answer their questions, but give them time to figure out how things will work. Taking on challenges um, is the next skill that is more than re a resilience. It's more than coping with things that happen. So think about some time when you actually took on a challenge and what you did. Um, one of the things that research has found that matters is uh, the way we praise children. And you talked about positive reinforcement. Let's go to Carol Dweck's um, research at Stanford and look at how we praise children um, and reinforce them matters. 
So Carol Dweck's research shows that if you praise kids for being smart, for being good at something, that they want to hold on to that label. But if you praise them for the strategies they're using, not just the effort, because there's a lot of good job, good job, good job going on, but um, which doesn't mean a whole lot. It's like um, uh, if you praise them specifically for what they're doing, well, you saw that that yellow shape uh, in the picture matches that yellow shape, and you put it together, and you help them look specifically at what they did to take on a challenge, they're much more likely to try hard things. This is the research of Stephanie Carlson. She's looked at how kids deal with really uh, difficult tasks. In this case, there's a toy that he wants, and none of the keys will open the box. And how long does he persist? And if he just does it as himself, that's one thing. But if he thinks about himself as in the third person, like how would Ellen manage this, he would work on it much longer. And you can see him wearing a cape. If he thinks of, if he puts on a cape and he says, how would Batman do this? That's pretending he will persist almost a year longer in age than other children. So pretending is not just playing. Pretending is helping children take on role models, uh, the cop, the, you know, the whatever role models that they take on, and learning how to deal with difficult situations. And the last one is self-directed engaged learning, and you should think about a time when you didn't learn something and what was going on. But one thing that's particularly important is that learning is best if it involves us socially and emotionally and cognitively. We tend to think of social emotional learning and cognitive learning. The brain shows no evidence of that. Every researcher I interviewed, uh, um, now hundreds, I've asked about social emotional or cognitive learning. Some people call these non-cognitive skills that couldn't be farther from the truth. Um, so they wouldn't be affecting academic achievement if they were non-cognitive skills. They're the how of learning, not the what of learning. Um, and so that's really important. I'm going to close um, with a video that we made at Vroom that uh, summarizes my message to all of you. We all have what it takes. I'm really rushing all the time. I don't have enough time just to sit down with them. Being a full-time mom and having a full-time job, it's not easy. I always worry, am I doing enough with my kids? Am I doing the important stuff that they need? teaching our kids. We did it, Mom! Yay! Good job! You don't really think of brain development at that young of an age, you know, when you're three months old. already have what it takes. This is an app that you can download for free, joinroom.org. It's birth through five, so it would be useful for the families that you work with to take everyday moments. And we use the science to involve uh, families and any other people who work with children in doing everyday activities in the moments that you already have with children that will promote that back and forth interaction, that will promote that um, that building of the child's brain that will promote uh, pr 
these life skills that we think are so important. Thank you, it was a pleasure to be with you.